Um, we have uh, four presentations here. Um, first, the first presentation is uh, presented uh, from uh, Luigi Ponti, a holistic approach to the invasion of olive by the pathogen Xylella fastidiosa in the Mediterranean basin. Please. Good evening, everybody. And I thought you were going to introduce me, but I'm going to do it on my own. And uh, I, I work as a researcher at a national, public national research institution called ENEA. We deal with uh, energy and the environment. And the, the main campus uh, is uh, close to Rome. And I don't know how many of you knows it, but we are the second largest research institution in, in Italy. The topic I'm going to uh, I'm going to address uh, today is uh, the recent invasion of olive systems in southern Italy by uh, uh, an exotic plant pathogen by the name of Xylella fastidiosa, which is also an emerging. Uh, problem worldwide because it causes problems in, in citrus in South America, in grape in North America, and it's growing as many other vector-borne diseases, either both in the plant uh, health domain and also in the human health domain, as you know. How many of you have heard before about Xylella fastidiosa? Two? Three, four, five, okay. Well, if you, it's, it's been a hot topic in the media in Italy for more than a year. Every other day you would, you would uh, read, uh, um, you would, it, it would make first page on the newspapers and there's, there's been a lot of discussion because we haven't had this pathogen in the Mediterranean basin ever, and it, 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 it was recovered in 2013, and it's a threat for, uh, um, uh, for olive uh, culture across the Mediterranean basin, and it potentially could destroy the whole uh, olive uh, cultivation in the Mediterranean basin because it, it's linked to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to the death of the, of the plant. It's called the, um, it's a slowly progressive disease and it, and it can, can lead to death of the plant. And it trans, it's transmitted by insects that, uh, that feed on the sap of the plant. So it's a vector-borne disease. So I want to I want to I want to start, and this is this is the main message I, I would like to give you. And if, if you ever happen to read about this topic again, you will, you will, I hope you ha you will have a better idea of, of what we're talking about. And this is something that um, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, who is an expert in the field and has been spent has spent his life uh, studying this. This pathogen that also causes a disease in grape called Pierce's disease. He says that in theory, um, a, parasi a parasite like Silella, because it has uh, such a wide uh, number of host plant species, and because the vectors are basically everywhere, it should be eventually widely distributed in in uh, in the um, geographically and you will find it everywhere, and it will cause an enormous amount of damage, which it doesn't, in fact. So why is it that this doesn't happen? And I'm going to try to, to, to answer this question. And, it's, and the answer is, is basically um, the, the title of, our, of the presentation. So in the word holistic, you find it in the word holistic. So you, would, you may ask yourself, holistic what? And holistic means that you have to try to factor in all the different biot biotic and abiotic factors that drive the dynamics uh, uh, of the geographic distribution and abundance uh, of pests. 
Some are some of are uh, non-biotic, so related to the abiotic environment. Some are some are some are biotic because, as I told you, this uh, disease uh, is transmitted by an insect, and this insect has natural enemies. So, it's a kind of a complica uh, complicated system. It it has a lot of complexity in, uh, in it. So the, the, the biological part of, of, the, of the story can get pretty complex uh, in, 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 uh, in agroecosystems. You will find a host plant that could, that could be olive, for example, that there are also associated plants that are not grown uh, for profit. And then there's herbivores, the blue guys up there, and their natural enemies, and hold the trophic levels, and you end up with a lot of interactions, and the climate that is changing on top of it, so it's difficult to figure out what's going on. Yes, okay, this is cool, and, but, but what next? The next thing is to try to um, take apart some of this complexity in, in, in a way that is, it, it allows us to manage the, the system on the ground and make some decisions that, that are based on science. So the, the approach we take is, is, is that we apply the same kind of model uh, across trophic, the, the trophic levels, and we model in the, in the basic, basic same way uh, plants, herbivores, and, and, and carnivores. Uh, this, is, uh, this occurs on, in the, on the, at the individual level, and then, they, and then of course, there's, there's not a single individual, there's a population in an ecosystem, and you can see the dy dynamics of it, and when you um, project it uh, on an area or uh, on a larger area like uh, the Mediterranean basin, you, will, you, you can draw a map and see uh, what the difference on the ground are. So how about an example? We actually did a study of a similar system in uh, California where uh, Xylella fastidiosa causes Pierce's disease uh, to, to grape. Uh, it's a disease that, also, that is also transmitted by an insect, and it can be uh, very serious, can lead the plant to death. And it was endemic in California until the, until the 90s when uh, an exotic insect, a lifopper, came about from northern Mexico and invaded California. And they were, there, were, there were fears that the, that the disease would destroy the whole uh, grape industry in California, but that didn't happen. I'm sorry about the colors, because uh, they're, they're not the right colors that I see in front of me, but what, what the study told, told us is that once the natural enemies that uh, were introduced for biological control, the densities were reduced um, they were 10 times lower than, 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 when, than what would be expected by projecting the, the, the distribution of the, of the exotic leaf hopper on its own. And also, we projected the geographic distribution of the pest based on its temperature tolerance, which varies across a, a range of, uh, of temperatures, and it's different from the one of the leaf hopper and the plant. And what you see is that when you match this information, uh, the, 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 temper, the temperature tolerance of the pest, its vector, and the plant, and the natural enemies, you end up with, with a much, with a much uh, narrower uh, a geographic distribution that is basically all down in the warmer areas of the state. And, in, and, what, and this is what you observe, that the, the, the disease is not a huge problem you, you will not find in you will not find it right now within the the, the higher highest priorities um, in the state and and we did also a study of of, uh, of olive so in the Mediterranean basin so we have the model for olive also in place and uh, so this, the same study that we did in California, we could do it in the Mediterranean basin for xylella and olive, and I think this would be uh, a good basis to make a um, decision on management. Uh, the whole discussion of xylella is about uh, a 
very aggressive eradication pro program that, was, that went into force some months ago that uh, entailed uh, destruction of infected plants, um, insecticide sprays uh, across vast areas of, of, uh, of our country, and tillage of the soil. All of these things are uh, very, very um, serious and aggressive measure, measures that didn't have any underlying uh, concept of what, what the ecology of the system was. So what, what, what I showed you for California, the pro um, potential distributions, pr distribution of the pest and the vector and the, and, uh, and, um, and the natural enemies is not known. In, in the Mediterranean basin, so we're just making uh, such, um, we're just taking such, uh, those eradication actions by here. We don't have a scientific basis for doing, for doing that. So this is a very, it, it is a general consideration that we, we can extract that and any time you want to either eradicate an invasive pest or manage an invasive or uh, native pest, you need to have a concept of uh, its regional pest status. Otherwise, uh, there, there may be no, no, no point in, uh, in taking any action at all. And in the whole story of Oxylella, in the eradication plant that went into force, the, probably the only piece of uh, action that had an ecological rationale to it was taken by a group of organic farmers that sued our government country and were able to stop the insectic, insecticide sprays. And that uh, allowed them to keep uh, organic certification, otherwise they would have lost it, and also saved a lot of insecticide ingestion to the consumer. So uh, this kind of consideration that were totally overlooked by um, national, the national institution that were supposed to look to, to those things were enforced by voluntary action of a small group of organic farmers that were able to stop a very, uh, very aggressive measure that had no ecological rationale for uh, when uh, uh, going into force. And this is the final piece of thought that I, that I offer for the network, uh, Organic Can Feed the World, which Paula requested by email. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so this important point that Luigi says, uh, it's uh, it, how to say, it's um, a special case that go to, to the mainstream that you, we have underlined these days, that uh, there are, we have to look to the agroecosystem and how it is functioning and uh, probably we'll find even special answers there. Thank you very much. Um, now... Uh, the second work, um, okay, I, uh, is, uh, it is uh, Patricia Schiatti here. Okay, I invite uh, Mr. El Arabi to do his presentation here. Uh, a new perspective of disease biocontrol in organic agriculture in Egypt. So, as um, Mr. El Arabi, it's uh, our colleague from Egypt. And uh, this uh, work is done in the framework of a uh, BioGuard project where Agro Bio Mediterraneo group, uh, it, it was a part of this uh, project. So please, uh, El Arabi, if you have something more to add, to add for public, for yourself, uh, you are welcome. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, buonasera a tutti. And that's nearly what all I know, I know about Italian, so. Don't expect much more. Um, uh, to be honest, this is my second time in Italy, but um, every time I come, I experience new town or city, and actually, it's a very beautiful country. So um, I'm here to present a part of the Biogard project that um, uh, I have the privilege to lead. Um, the Biogard project is, um, is an EU project that is co-funded by the EU and the Egyptian partner. 
the program is called the RDI, which is Research, Development, and Innovation uh, Fund. The project is started in May 2013, and it received a fund nearly half a million euros. We are five partners. Um, partner is Libra, which is the grant holder. The Libra is a bio uh, dynamic agriculture company, which is a daughter company for SECAM. Um, probably you heard the name SECAM earlier today, which is one of the leading organic uh, food agriculture uh, companies in Egypt and in the Middle East. Um, also, we have uh, two universities, um, which is the TU Graz in Austria and Julius Kuhn Institute in Germany. And we also have from Egypt the Agriculture Research Center. And of course, um, the IFOM uh, is our fifth partner. So this is a picture was taken uh, in the first annual meeting for the whole team in Egypt. And this is where in Heliopolis University uh, premises, Heliopolis University is also owned by SACOM. And it's the first university in Egypt that it has a concept of sustainable development. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce you the objective of the project BioGuard. The main objective or the scientific objective is to produce a microbial mixture that is able to biocontrol the nematodes and the human pathogens as well as the plant pathogens. Not all of them, of course, we are going to pick some models and build on that model the concept itself. So the main target pathogens that we are looking at are the human pathogens. We picked the model Salmonella, which is the second largest cause of human foodborne illness after Campylobacter. And we picked the crop tomato because it's a very important crop in Egypt and in the whole world. Plus, uh, there are three cases that were internationally reported in 2002, 2008, and 2012 that had an outbreak from salmonellosis associated with consumption of tomatoes. So in total, we did a lot of sampling in Egypt in all regions to represent different areas and different soils. So in Egypt, we have two main types of soil, which is our, um, the sandy soil and the clay soil. And we collected soil samples, rhizosphere, um, water, irrigation water samples, plant parts, and we nearly had about 400 samples. And all these samples were tested for the presence of human pathogens. And we followed the, um, all the necessary steps to detect the, the salmonella by selective culturing and doing 16S RNA uh, sequencing. And also we uh, actually enrolled in this project the well-identified uh, species of salmonella, which is the Enterica by Cirovar typhimurium. And we have from the typhimurium list, we have all these uh, plant isolates that were, um, were recorded that they were associated with human illness. The second um, bacterial pathogen, which is the causative agent of the potato brown rot. Potato cropping in Egypt is quite large and it's one of the most important crops that being exported to Europe. And the Rallistonia solaniserum is the bacterial agent that caused this disease to potato, and it's a quarantine disease. So if it's detected in potato, we are going to lose this business. So it is very important to know that the Rallistonia solaniserum is really quite resistant to a lot of antibiotics and a lot of pesticides or herbicides or any kind of chemical that you can use to, to uh, control this uh, bacterial disease. And Again, we do all the necessary things to identify the salmonella by culturing, by wilting, and by uh, multiplex PCR to well identify this bacterium. And we found that the main um, type that it's uh, actually in Egypt is the race 3 uh, phylotype 2. We move forward to another uh, pest, which is the nematode, the root knot nematode which is quite abundant in the Egyptian soil. So now I introduce to you three type of diseases that we are intended to control with this uh, scientific concept or scientific approach. The human pathogen, the plant bacterial pathogen, and the plant nematode. 
So this is for, to confirm the community of uh, Melodogen incognita, the root, root knot nematode. So the first thing that we did is, um, is the antagonistic bacteria. So we go to the soil and we test the rhizosphere of healthy plants and we would like to know why they are healthy. So we test the, the, bacterial the bacterial community in the rhizosphere and why they are there and they are not killed by the exudates of the roots or anything in the, in the neighborhood. And we test them, their ability against this harmful bacteria. So we go to antagonistic bacteria, we isolated around 130 isolates, and we uh, picked actually about eight of them that de uh, exhibited high antagonism against Ralistonia and the Salmonella and also nematodes. And we did also the, the culture methods, which is the, the very simple one to, to see the inhibition zones. And some of them, as you can see, they really give a high inhibition zones. Maybe some of them, they were more than three centimeters in diameter. Uh, we, from these eight, we took three and we fully sequenced them and we published uh, these sequences. And uh, they were all uh, spore formers and actinomycetes. And the reason that we picked these because they are spore formers, it means that they are really good survivors in, in the soil. Bacteriophages is the second biocontrol agent, and I'm not sure if you're all familiar with bacteriophages or not, but bacteriophages are natural enemies to bacteria. And they are very, very much specific to, it can be to one genus, it can be to one species, it can be to only one strain. So we call them the bacterial eaters. They eat the bacteria alive and they kill them. So this is how they do to the bacterial cell. You can see one bacter bacteriophage, it's a virus, but it's not bad as you hear virus. So it infects one bacteria and produces hundreds of other particles and kill the bacterial cells. So in that sense, we isolated a lot of bacteriophages and we picked some of them to infect the salmonella. And this is uh, the ones that we picked and these are the electron microscope uh, fo footages uh, for uh, the phages that we isolated. And we found that these phages can completely wipe out the bacteria, like they can completely kill the, the salmonella that we picked on plates. And as we speak now, we're actually performing the greenhouse experiment. And the preliminary data that we have shows that the bacteriophage actually can really reduce the number of salmonella in leaves and in rhizosphere of tomato, which is uh, something really uh, we were looking for. The third part of this bioguard is the medicinal plants. So medicinal plants have very well-known history about their ability to control uh, some of the diseases. Uh, but in these cases, we are also using bi biological control. So we don't, we, we don't want to have a plant extract or a plant that actually can kill our beneficial microorganisms that we are, going, we are intending to use in the soil or intending to, uh, to apply in, in, in the field. But to test that, we picked a lot of plants, about 90 plants, and from those we found these 10 were very healthy from nematodes especially. And and from these 10, we actually isolated the, benef the beneficial bacteria that I uh, mentioned earlier. So from those 10, we did three things. We took the leaf extract, the root extract, and the whole plant extract. We wanted to know which is better to mix with our beneficial organisms. And we tested that on the nematodes larva. And you can see from the yellow part that this Two uh, plants especially, they were the highest effective against the nematodes, the root knot nematodes that we have. And they almost killed all the larva in 48 hours. And the nice thing is about it that the roots, the dried roots here that we had, didn't have any inhibitory effect on the beneficial microorganisms that we isolated or intended to use. So now in concept, we have this very efficient root um, extracts against nematodes. They are very friendly with our beneficial microorganisms and they cannot do anything with bacteriophage. So basically what we are looking at right now is 
And this is just a simple example how this um, root extract killed the nematode or prevented the, the infection of nematode in tomatoes. And um, you can see the difference clearly in, in the pictures. So is BioGuard only about laboratory? Do we just do research? No, the whole concept is just not just research because we know that research only is not enough to apply this concept in farms. As from all previous presentation that I heard, which I was really amazed because I learned a lot, um, because I'm not I'm not organic agriculture specialist myself. I'm I'm a microbiologist, and I spent all my life in the lab, behind the microscope in petri dishes. So, it was really interesting for me to know what is the concept of organic agriculture, and in Egypt, I think it's quite difficult because. Um, we don't have a really fertile soil, mostly it's desert. And the farmers, they just want something to kill parasites. They don't care about healthy food. They, they care about their assets, their money. And consumers, they're not well much aware what is the difference between this and that. So in this project, we are trying to get all these stakeholders, if you wish to call, Together, besides the scientific work that we are doing, we're also doing a lot of training to, and a lot of awareness to people. So we conducted two training modules so far to farmers in different regions in Egypt about what is the importance of applying organic concepts, organic farming concepts, and how to, to use their re simple resources to do a lot of things that enhance their production. We also tried as much as we can to uh, publicize our work to uh, the public. And so we did uh, a workshop uh, that was in June uh, this year. And it was in celebration with the uh, UN International Year of the Soils. Um, and in that, in that workshop, we gathered uh, the, the government officials, the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Land Reclamation and Irrigation. And we had a lot of expertise, a lot of people from the public, the, the media and everyone um, was invited um, to know the concept that we are introducing. Uh, what else we are planning to do? Um, actually, by the end of the project, which is we are planning to terminate the project or actually just finish the, the lab work, at least, or the technical work uh, in May 2016. And by the end of this, we are going to have uh, an international conference uh, in Egypt. So uh, I wish to see you all there. I want to present you more data because um, right now we are not just testing a bacteria on a plant. It's exactly what all the um, fine scientists described before me that we are testing the, the effect of this bacteria on the biodiversity in the soil. We are testing the plant reaction of a, a, applying this um, beneficial microorganisms or the medicinal plants extracts to them. So it's not just about, is it good that killing? No, we are caring so much about the natural flora and the, 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 the biodiversity that it's around the, the plants and, and so on. And the, the, of course, the healthy, uh, the soil health. Um, so with this, I would like to actually uh, conclude that um, with the BioGuard, it's not just um, we are trying to kill a disease. Because killing a disease is chemical is much easier. But as you all said, we need to look at disease in different angle. We need to look to kill it efficiently by using natural elements, enemies. But also, we need to care so much about the nature itself and preserve the biodiversity that actually helps enhance our production of our crops. So exactly as uh, my, my friend Luigi did. Uh, so this is my, uh, I would like to, to contribute to the Expo 2015. Um, and thank you all for uh, your attention and mucho uh, grazie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question. Uh, uh, there is somebody to...
Yes, somebody to give the microphone to the professor, please. To professor? Uh, Altieri, professor Altieri. No, I just wanted to make uh, three observations. One is that uh, antagonist mixtures and, ba and, and uh, bacteriophage mixtures have been used by farmers for, for years. For example, in Cuba, they use what they call mountain tea. They harvest from the forest uh, all the litter that is very rich in, in, in something like 200 different bacteria that can have the same effect that, that you're talking about. The second thing is that the mechanism, for example, of, uh, of certain crap plants that you have there in your list, especially tajetes, tajetes doesn't work as a, as, a, as a bacterial inhibitor when you do the, the extracts. Basically what it does, it works as a decoy crop. The, met, the, the, the nematodes colonize the roots of the tajetes and once they're inside, then they die because there is a chemical inside the roots. So you will never find the effect the way that you're, you're doing it. And the third one has to do with the fact that, uh, that actually, for example, certain of these plants that you're testing in the lab, uh, the mechanism is not from it, 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 what happens in the soil that there is, a, there is, a, there is a, the decomposition that leads to certain metabolites. For example, the crucifers that can be used as, an, as nematicides and also as, uh, against diseases, the glucosinolates that are in the tissue they have to be um, uh, transformed into a secondary metabolite to have the effect. So I think that it's very important before you go to the farmers and tell them what to do based on your uh, lab exams, is you have to do the tests in the, in the soil under the farmers' conditions and see the mechanisms of action. Thanks a lot for your comment. They are very valuable. And for the sake of the time, I just presented the concept, but I would like to emphasize that the mode of action of all these bacteria and bacteriophage and all these plants, they are extensively being studied right now in the labs and also in the greenhouse as a condition. So it's, it's by default or like it, your comment makes a lot of sense that before moving to the field application or the real application with farmers, we have to test it in, in stages. So the first stage is the lab, of course, to just make a narrow selection of the natural enemies that we are going to use. And the second stage is in the greenhouse system where we think that the bacterial can actually survive or the, this mixture altogether can survive in the greenhouse. And when we repeat this, and this is find like repeatedly uh, the same results we get, it's when we apply in the open field experimental first and then we can verify this result. So in, in two years project, I think, I think um, we are trying to maximize the, the, um, the use of the time and the resources that we are trying to um, reach the best conditions to kill this three uh, different uh, type of, of pathogens or disease. Because what you actually mentioned, of course, then antagonistic bacteria is not something you knew. It's been there for a really long time. But the, 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 the concept itself, it's not just the antagonistic bacteria, it's the mixture itself. It's like the plant and the bacteriophage, they are not intended to use separately. We are intended to use as a mixture altogether, just like to a farmers to apply in the plant, just to tell them or tell the farmers, you apply this in the plant, hopefully, uh, if it works and we find out that uh, in a year, um, then you're protecting the, your tomato or your potato against these pathogens. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Altieri. Uh, this is, uh, I want to say, the, um, we, uh, an ar a more uh, a wider argument. This means that sometimes we can have answer from the research, but we have to, to open our eyes. Probably we have not seen other interaction that can be um, uh, used in this uh, case. Thank you very much. And now, uh, the next presentation um, with the title Biofumigant Plants and Materials as Bio-Based in Plant Management and Protection will be presented from um, Luca Lazzeri. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced well. Um, it is a research, uh, a long research of about 20 years. Do you, it's, uh, can I help you? Uh, 
Ah, yeah, it's not. Uh, it's uh, another directory. Mm. May you search, I can just start. So, uh, uh, to, to gain time, I take uh, the occasion for uh, uh, thanking very much uh, both uh, Paola and uh, Antonio that gave me the uh, opportunity to speak for the first time at the Organic uh, uh, Farmer and uh, Association of uh, uh, 20 years uh, old uh, uh, work. Yes, this is. That, uh, Uh, on uh, on uh, Brassica, and uh, is uh, a, 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 a honor to be uh, introduced from the question of uh, Miguel Altieri on uh, crucifer and their uh, nematodes uh, efficacy, because uh, this is our uh, work from 20 years. Of course, uh, speaking in 10 minutes of 20 years' experience is a sort of uh, a mission impossible, but uh, uh, we start uh, uh, immediately for the uh, few time that uh, we have. This is the definition of biofumigation. It means uh, the idea that biomass uh, and, uh, is uh, different uh, uh, and only some of them are able to release very active or active allelopathic uh, compound. And uh, uh, for uh, uh, this, uh, uh, we, uh, we use the, the brassicas that has uh, this uh, system for, as an endogenous system for defensing itself that, uh, as you can see very quickly, there is a substrate, the glucosinolate, that in presence of an endogenous enzyme that is myrosinase in water that is a regent of the reaction, produce quickly some degradation product, uh, hydrolysis product, that can be isotacionized or nitrile uh, uh, as uh, uh, the uh, main uh, products, depending from the pH of the reaction. Uh, of course, uh, listening to you can think about VAPAM, that is the, of the same family, but uh, I can uh, say that uh, is not a problem because uh, this is the uh, definition of allyl isotacinates of the Food and Drug Administration, a safe food, but really we are eating it uh, every time that we use mustard and uh, rucola and uh, Brussels and so on. Uh, our aim was not to produce, to prepare a biopesticides. It's not of, of interest. We, are, we have started from following the, uh, in my opinion, the organic, farm, uh, the organic uh, farming um, strategy to uh, produce bioactive biomasses that is completely different from the purified uh, compound. And uh, for this, uh, we, we uh, studied the way that the plants use for defensing itself. In the health cell, you can see there is a big vacuum also where there is the glucosinolate that is uh, separated from, uh, in this way, is separated from myrosinic bonds that are um, widespread in the cell. And so where, when there is a lesion that is, can be for biotic or abiotic uh, reason, uh, um, the enzyme, the substrate keep, keep in contact, the plants release isotacinates where is attacked. Uh, the story that the regent the water is a regent, is a fundamental uh, step for uh, managing this uh, system. So uh, I, thought, I told that we, we want to produce uh, bioactive biomasses. And so what, what uh, we have done, uh, starting from the story that nothing is new after the sun, un under the sun, you can see that in the 10th century, uh, the uh, Surapala report that Crucifer had specific uh, activity, specific characteristic for uh, uh, a green manure. And is, uh, I think, uh, a, 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 um, an aspect to uh, keep in great attention, considering that the uh, old traditional knowledge is uh, fundamental, as has been, done, has been said several times in these two days. 
So the first step is uh, to select, because of course, uh, uh, glucosinolates are around 200, where they are different for chemical and physical uh, characteristics. And so, uh, selecting for a high level in the plants, and so when we chop the plants, uh, the, we, we activate the reaction, then we incorporate, and there is a sort of gasification in soil, and this makes them interesting for control of soil-borne nematodes, wildworms, and so on. The second step is to select plant for a high level in roots. In this way, the, the nematodes are recalled in the surface uh, uh, from the exudates of the plants, uh, attack the plants, but uh, it began to feed uh, uh, a poison of media, and so it dead on uh, the uh, roots. Uh, the, this is system is the only way both in conventional and organic, to recall the, uh, from the uh, tank in the deep part of soil of nematodes uh, for uh, controlling them. I do not report re results, but I see only here that is the uh, common uh, non-biofumigant green manure that with the fucinic acid make, uh, show that uh, nematodes are living. Uh, and instead, uh, in uh, Eruca, there is a necrosis. I mean that the nematodes are dead on roots. Of course, working on, on green manure is a fantastic option, but not always is easy or is not a normal, uh, obvious to have a great plant and great uh, results. And so the hypothesis is to have a, a, a defatted seed meal uh, produced from seed is a, a fantastic because it can be uh, give an, an additional uh, um, opportunity that, is, uh, uh, that needs a, a biotechnology step for reactivate the enzyme and optimize the release that uh, uh, after extraction is, uh, under, uh, is of around 20%, but after the, uh, the biotechnological natural approach, it arrives around at the rate of 100%. Another, uh, the another option is uh, the liquid. The isotheosinates are hydro hydrophobic. This means that in, uh, in an oil-water emulsion, the emulsion activated the reaction, and the, uh, the isotheosinate no normally remain in the uh, oil phase. And so when we spray them on the plants, they, they, uh, uh, they determine a an efficacy, clear efficacy, that is the biofumigant acti action. Uh, here I report uh, only another results on red scale, and you can see that only working on oil, we have the same results for mineral oil. I can say that is no sense, I repeat, no sense that in organic farming, in organic farming we have, we have admitted the mineral oil that have a time of degradation in soil of around 200 years. And uh, this means that we have no an idea of how many time and mineral oil remain in soil because, because 200 years ago there isn't mineral oils available. So with uh, this natural approach, we can have the same results that uh, are strong improved if we apply even with meal that apply give a 30% more of activity. So. Uh, uh, I am at the end for staying in time. This is the option. This, uh, this, all this uh, uh, proposal can be used in synergy. Uh, green manure with pellets, liquids with green manure, and so on. And uh, these are uh, the uh, conclusion that uh, you can uh, read uh, alone and uh, uh, because uh, I prefer if there are some questions to answer, considering that I have been uh, extremely on the surface of the story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there is any question? Okay, I, I um, want to, to, to explain a problem uh, that um, discussing with the farmers uh, in Albania, I'm coming from Albania, and uh, a big problem in greenhouses in Albania, tomatoes especially, there is nematodes and they are using pesticides and they say, well, again, don't find a way how to, to, to control the nematodes, even conventional ones. Uh, so I don't know uh, if this can be uh, directly um, applied to the farmers. It's uh, a method that can be directly, I mean, uh, 
yeah. it's ready to, to, to be used in practice. Yes, uh, yes. The, all all uh, these product, uh, I am I am lucky because I have a, uh, we I, I collaborate with a company from uh, 15 years that is commercializing these products, and so uh, completely available now uh, commercializing 24 countries in the world, from USA to Australia and, and in Europe and so on. Uh, I don't know in Albania, <laughs> really. Okay. But uh, uh, I, I want to add that uh, um, is uh, uh, it, uh, an approach that is uh, completely in the uh, strategy of a biorefinery approach. I mean that uh, is, a, a, is a products that are made from the farmer, for, for the farmer, because the, the, the fatted seed meal, the, the seeds are produced in a commodity uh, agriculture and uh, the, the products are given for the horticultural, mainly horticultural high, high value uh, crops. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, yes, I, I repeat, are even completely available, even if this system uh, permit us to uh, uh, arrive to uh, um, study every, every, every time, every year, new uh, field of application. Uh, now we are working on plant, or the problem of the replant, for example, or we are, we are working on post-harvest treatment and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, uh, we have uh, another presentation, I don't know, but we started uh, really very late and uh, I really participants here invited to do a presentation not more than 10 minutes. So it's uh, up to you if you... Yes, it's the celebration. Okay, uh, do you agree five minutes? It's too short, but uh, what can we do? Buonasera, thank you, and thanks for this time. The study I'm going to present you with has to do with the management of uh, brown rot in organic cherry orchards. And uh, this is the same sort of rot that attacks uh, peaches and apricots. So the crucial times are two during the flowering and the harvesting. So during these periods, if it rains a lot, if there is humidity, so we have this fungal disease that can sort of get rife in the orchard and sort of spread all over the place. And this disease is extremely dangerous for plants, especially when the, tree, the cherry varieties are quite sensitive or if they are about to, to uh, sort of produce the fruit. Here you see the chart of one of the testing that we carried out, and we compared the baseline Bacillus sutilis, a microorganism, and uh, calcium polysulfate. And we did it during the flowering period. Well, the result was the following. In 2015, we had uh, a very strong and heavy infection on, during the flowering phase, and 58% uh, of flowers, of the tax flowers, on uh, the sort of untreated uh, sort of uh, testimony, and we had a number of effectiveness of 78%, and the other one had a lower efficacy up to 37%. Here you see 
sul quale appunto scorro rapidamente e con il quale abbiamo semplicemente messo in the around Vignola and you see some snaps of flowers and how they saw after the flowering you see that the attack was made during the flowering and uh, the brown rot makes also the branch die and dry out. We also did some pre-harvest testing. That's the second phase when the food gets sensitive. So when technically there is the specific sort of color changing process, it's a very, very delicate moment and uh, we tried to test these different solutions and here you see the results. At the first glance you see that the results are not very satisfactory. As to results, we can say that brown rot is a fungal disease that during the pre-harvest is still to be fixed, especially if it rains. Se può passare alle conclusioni, mi scuso, ma purtroppo davvero non abbiamo tempo. Here you see the spots on the fruits and we tested several products. So we have the fungal disease on the one hand and also these residues after the treatment, so the spots. So conclusions are that calcium polysulfide gave the best results during the blossom the blossoming season, however, cannot be used during the pre-harvest because a certain interval needs to sort of uh, pass by. So the latency time is too short, according to the law, the one that uh, we would have used. And so we had a pre-harvest difficult time, and uh, we would like to better investigate future perspectives. And uh, as future avenues of research, uh, we have identified some physical protection systems like some rain covers or special nets for insects with some rain covers associated or the use of antagonistic fungi and also the use of silicon. See to what extent silicon can improve the effects of products. I mean, like, uh, for instance, uh, sulfur. Thank you very much for being so short. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, um, so um, uh, now all the presentations are finished. We have to start uh, uh, the celebration that will be at uh, uh, the Agrotourism, Case, uh, I, I forgot uh, the name, Casale Mora. Uh, so there is the list of uh, posters here, so you can have uh, even tomorrow time to, to have a look on uh, them. Thank you very much for following and uh, see you the next events. Thank you.